may be seated. This is the reason we've gathered, is to give God the glory that is due His name. Indeed, He has moved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, that we may walk in His ways. Well, this morning, I'd like to ask you, if you would, to take your Bible and turn with me to Corinthians chapter 12. Go to Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and uh, just kind of as we begin turning there and looking in your Bible and thinking a little bit about this day that we've set aside, we, we are not going to be looking at Micah, but we're going to be looking at a passage of Scripture that causes us to learn much and to think deeply about the church. I mean, what would cause us on a Sunday morning where there's, yes, thank you very much. If you don't have a sermon outline, you're going to need one this morning. Lift your hand. These guys will give you one. Sorry. We have a couple of needs over here and a couple of down there, so they'll get one to you. We, we come to come to be together as a church family on rain or shine in, I was going to say sleet or snow, but praise God we don't have that, Right? Um, but we come together for a glorious reason. And, and, and it's this body that we wind up being connected to, that we would even put out tables to break bread together, to, to eat together, to enjoy one another, that we go and climb around on each other's roofs, fixing roof leaks, that we, that we call one another, that we email one another. This morning there were Zoom groups meeting. Um, that Those who, it's really not safe for them perhaps because of deep, um, uh, health problems in their life that, that, that just not yet for them. So, so why are we yearning for all of this connection? Why are we interacting in this way? And 1 Corinthians is going to help us to see what God's grand design is. Free Solo. Has anybody seen the National Geographic Free Solo? This is an amazing thing. Um, just this last week, I watched it again with my daughter and my niece, Grace Coleman, and, and Cheryl were there, and um, we, we looked at this amazing story that involves El Capitan. Do you know what El Capitan is? El Capitan is in Yosemite Valley. It's in Yosemite outside. Um, it's really on the border of California. Um, and uh, the Nevada, and there's this just amazing national park there. And El Capitan is a 3,000-foot monolith granite wall that people have been climbing um, since the 1940s, always, of course, with ropes and always uh, with all kinds of gear, but one of the great world climbers of the world, and you see him there in his red jacket and uh, so forth, he said, I'm going to do it without ropes. I'm going to do El Capitan. And he began training, years and years training. And as you see this little human being standing there next to what would be a 300-story building, that's 3,000 feet, Alex comes along and he says, I'm going to conquer it. And so with video crew trying to stay out of his way and not distract him on the most dangerous climb that any person has ever undertaken, Alex set off to do it. No ropes, just his fingers and his feet. Having practiced move after move with ropes for years, and any false move, it has to be a perfect climb. If it's not a perfect climb, he dies. Training his mind, training his hands, training his feet, making it all the way through, he finally crawled out on top on June 3rd, 2017. It took him two hours and 57 minutes. Now, just look at that guy. There's not an ounce of fat on him, obviously. <laughs> but just think about that. Think about this picture. Now, when I was growing up, my dad would say, what a fool. What 
fool would do that. The, the whole video crew, the entire, if you watch the film, they were genuinely terrified. And they had plans of what happens if he slips. They had plans about what to do and not to do with the cameras. But Alex comes through, and after we watched that film, rather astounded the other night, we sat there and we said, you know, in a way, in a very powerful way, that glorifies God. You say, How, how's that? He, he obviously doesn't know the Lord. He obviously is not trusting in the Lord. He climbed out on top and said, look what I did. I mean, yeah, he, he was, I'm not sure how humble he was, but he, he wasn't obnoxious. It's just, it was a, a tremendous feat and of accomplishment. But you see, God has made us in an astounding way. The things that God has made the human to be able to do is amazing. It's glorious. And you see, this points to the glory of God and his design. This points that, that it's not just, I mean, you, somebody could say, well, wait a minute, a squirrel can run up El Capitan, probably a lot faster. Yes, but a squirrel can't go to the moon. A squirrel can't go to the deepest part of the ocean. A squirrel, a, a, I mean, we, when we see the way God has made us in his image and in his likeness for his glory and the way that he has equipped the human body and the human mind, it is truly astounding. Now, this should shout volumes to um, any scientist, and we, we obviously don't see the things that are most obvious, um, that, are very, that are right before us, but anyone who has studied human anatomy and studies the whole muscular system of the human body, it is an extremely, extremely magnificent design, a design that really is above all the other designs. And not only about the muscular system, just that alone is truly amazing. We've all looked at some of those pictures before. What about the way God made all of the organs of the body to work? The, the stomach and the heart and the esophagus and the brain and the eyes and the ears and the pancreas and the, the liver and the kidneys and all of it comes together and it works. Notice this passage of Scripture, Psalm 139 in verses 13 and 14 says, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. Let's read verse 14. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. You see, the body is a glorious design of God. And when we see what the Scripture says about the church and who we are and why we come out on a rainy Sunday and why we come week after week, month after month, listen to this, decade after decade, I'm looking at a few people that have been here longer than I've been alive that this has been their church family. Many people and some that are watching by video because they're now at that age where they are a little bit more at risk or actually a great deal more at risk at this moment. Um, so they, we, 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 what causes us to do this? this? This body that we have together that's fearfully and wonderfully made. Well, the Bible tells us about the body of the church. And so when we come to the beauty, the tremendous beauty of the body of Christ, we want to see what 1 Corinthians describes. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is, is specifically and most pointedly dealing with the uses of spiritual gifts within the church. But it's not only about spiritual gifts within the church. It's about the body being knit together, and there's, there's many other aspects of church life that 1 Corinthians chapter 12 alludes to. And so, we want to see and hear what God's Word says. Look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 14. For just as the body 
is one, can you underline the word one? Just as the body is one and has many members, all the members of the body, though many, are, underline that, one body. So this is talking about, right here at the top, the physical body that you have. That your body is made up of members. The member of your legs, the member of your hands, the member of your eyes. Look what it says. So it is with Christ. There it is. Circle that phrase, so it is with Christ. Verse 13. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Now, let me remind you that the people of Corinth came from really all over the world because of the where it's situated in what is modern-day Greece. The Corinthian people were really from everywhere. It's actually very much like South Florida. I mean, when you kind of think about it, we represent that a lot. Um, people here from every creed, every tribe, every tongue practically. And it's not just a bunch of home folks here in South Florida. Well, it wasn't just a home, bunch of home folks in, in Corinth. And so the church that was in Corinth was a diverse church. And they had many ideas of the world flowing into them. And there was a lot of problems in the life of the church that were coming out of the world into the church. In fact, this letter is a great correction of the church. There's a great rebuke of the church about several things, and Paul is having to explain it to them about how they're to act and how they're to live and their morality and their theology and their, their interactions with each other. So he was really having to describe for them how they are to relate as a church family. And so, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit tells us that the body, though Greek, though Jew, though even slave, and though even free men, that they are together in one body. You talk about diversity, they had diversity. And look what it says at the end of verse 13, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Now look at verse 14. For the body does not kiss, consist of one member, but many. So he says it again in verse 15. And here he, just, he, he explains it. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. So even if your foot could speak and it says, nope, I'm not part of the body, he said, you're still part of the body. Look at verse 16. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. Verse 17, if the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, underline it, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. Verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. We're going to talk about that. What does that mean? And on those parts of the body that we think less honor, honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And un, our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty. Verse 24. Which our, own, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be, underline it, no division in the body but that the members may have the same care for one another. Look at verse 26. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Let's all read verse 27 at the bottom. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. 
So verse 27 is this tremendous synopsis of the beautiful body of Christ, that which God has made. Let's, let's take a few notes here. Let's see what this passage is saying. Number one, notice that the tr- it is the Trinity's work in designing the church body. It is done by the Trinity. You say, the Trinity, really? All three? Yes, absolutely, all three. Look at this. God the Son's work in the building of the body. Look at verse 12 up there at the top. Look what it says. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one, so it is with what? With Christ. And we see in 1 John that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And listen to what it says. John 1 says, and nothing has come into being that was not created by the Son. Indeed, this is the Son's work. This is who we are in Him. Notice this as well in verse 13. Notice what it says. For in one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. This is the Holy Spirit. This is the Spirit's work in building us. So Jesus pays for us, and the Holy Spirit brings us in to fellowship with one another. It's the Spirit that immerses us in Christ. And then in verse 18, skip down and look at verse 18. But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, and each one of them as he chose. Look down at verse 24. God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it. So the picture is this. God the Son, God the Spirit, and God the Father builds the body of the church. This is the picture of God working in unison with himself for our glory. So letter A, this is the work of God, not man. Now why is that important for us to say? Because some people are confused about where the church comes from. Some people think that the church is just a bunch of guys that got together, a bunch of gals that got together, and they invented the church, and they started writing about all of that. And we want to say very, very clearly that God's people are created by God for himself, and that's whether in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, we see that the church comes from God. This is his design, not man, just like marriage between a man and a woman. Go back and look at Genesis 1 and 2 and 3, and you will see that God is the one who makes marriage. We didn't come up with that. We didn't come up with marriage, and we didn't come up with a church. God did. That's important for us to recognize. Letter B, there is a massive characteristic of the Godhead in the church, and here's what it is. It is relational and unified in nature. So when we talk about the Godhead, right above the word there, the Godhead, that's the Trinity, okay? And the word Trinity does not occur in the Bible, but we see the Trinity from the first chapter of the Bible all the way to the last chapter of the Bible, that God is Father, Son, and Spirit. So we see this here that when we look at, and I have a little diagram off to the side there, I want you to see this, this this is Father, Son, and Spirit. And as we have talked about the Trinity, we want to see that our God is one God in three persons. Now, there's some that are new to us. There's some people that are new to us today, and no one has ever really explained that to you. And um, I want you to know that part of the reason no one has ever really explained that to you perfectly is because that is something that's beyond explainable. If anybody can attempt to perfectly explain that to you, you need to run away. Because this is, this is truly one of those great mysteries of the essence of God and His glory. But He's told us enough to know that He is truly one God in three persons. This is His essence. And it has always been this way. He has been this way before time began. He has always been this way and He will always be this way. Father, Son, and Spirit. And I often, I often act like this, I often do this motion because the picture is this, that God in all that he is perfectly relates within himself. Now Marcy and I are a husband and wife and we know that the scripture says the two shall become one. And we're one in a lot of ways. But you know what, sometimes we don't perfectly relate to each other. She's wrong, you know, part of the time. So, um, 
And when she's wrong, you know, we don't relate to it. But, you know, the, the bottom line is, is that even as Christians who have been bought by the blood of Christ, and even as Christians who have been given the Holy Spirit, we still are in this fleshly life, and sometimes we still struggle in being one. That struggle never exists within the Trinity. The Father perfectly exalts the Son, and the Son perfectly exalts the Father, and the Spirit comes, and they, they work within their grand purpose, His grand purpose together perfectly, because there is no sin, there is no division within Him. And so when we talk about the fact that God has made the church one body, it's a little bit similar to that. What we see over and over again in verse 12 and 13, how many times does the word one show up? Look at that. Look in verse 13. For just as the body is one, circle it, and has many members, all of the members of the body, though many are what? One. So it is with Christ. Verse 13. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into what? One body. Over and over again at the end of that, and all were made to drink of one spirit. What is the point being made? You are one. You are together. And the inference here is, as Christ is in the Father and as Christ is in the Spirit, so we are in one another with him. Letter C. So it is with the church body. It is relational and unified. It is relational and unified. Look at Acts 20, verse 28. He says, this is Paul's final words to the people of Ephesus, to the pastors that are at Ephesus. And he says to them, pay careful attention to yourselves, you as pastors, and to what? All the flock. Down there at the bottom of the page, look what he says. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, read it out loud together, which he obtained with his own blood. So how does the church become God's? Jesus pays for it. He pays for it with his own blood. He obtained it. He purchased it. That's what the word there is. He purchased it. You see, entry to the true, true, to the true church is only through faith in Christ's death and resurrection. There is no way to enter the true church without the blood of Christ. This is what makes the church the church. Now, look right up here for just a second. I know you're flipping your sheet, and that's fine, but look up here. There are some people who think that by coming and sitting in the church, or even sometimes coming and serving in the church, that while they've never had a conversion to faith in Christ, that they would say, I'm, I'm, I'm good, I'm in. And we would want to be very clear to you that say, you could come to this church year after year, decade after decade, and if your faith is not solely in Christ, my friend, it's not the human physical example and, and, and manifestation here that is what makes you the church. It is the beautiful, mysterious glory of Christ that saves us. And it is faith in his death and resurrection that makes us truly in the body of Christ. You see, going to church and sitting in a church building doesn't make you a Christian any more than if you were to go sit in a garage that it's going to make you into a car. That's, that's not what can make you into the car. You could stay in a garage all the rest of your life and you're never going to become a car. But when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we are converted into his body. Notice the next thing. Not only do we see that the Trinity is the, design, uh, is the designer of the church and the, the great builder of the church, but number two, notice God's glorious vision for the church. Letter A. God's vision is for unified fellowship. 
We've really just mentioned that. But look at verse 12 over there in the box. It says, for just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. This is what God has made us to be, to be unified in fellowship. Look at verse 14. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. We are unified. And in verse 25 it says, fill it in, there are no divisions among you. That there's, when, we look, when we look at it spiritually, there's not to be a division. Now, part of this is a response to chapter 1 and verse 13. They had a division in the church, and the Apostle Paul is dealing with that. That's, that's part of what he's dealing with as we see that there's different teachers, there's different, and, and we can look at some of these, fill these, some of these in. It's possible factions. There's many churches that have been torn apart by factions, and the Corinthian church was no different in that. Where do factions come from? That can be different teachers. One is of Paulos, one is of Paul, maybe one is of Barnabas. You see, there's there's different threats upon that. What about this? Different ethnicities. That some people in their, in their ethnicity and that the powerful cultural things of that, that becomes their primary identity instead of Christ. And what, what Paul is saying to the Corinthian church, and I believe what the Holy Spirit is saying to us is, oh no, some are Jewish, some are Gentile, some are even free, and some are even slaves, but you're all in the body of Christ. You see, this goes beyond our ethnicity. So not only the teachers that we follow, but the ethnicity. What about this? Different classes. There are some people that would say, oh, you know, it has to do with what side of the railroad tracks you grew up on or what side you currently live on. You know, what is your income? What's your status? What class are you in? If we were in India right now, that's even a bigger issue. Marcy and I used to serve in North Africa And sometimes it was ethnic, but a lot of times it was also class. It was the rich versus the poor. And it was one of the most beautiful manifestations of the gospel when you would see Arabs and Kabyles and Shawi and even French coming together and worshiping. You didn't see that happening anywhere else in society. And so, you know, an Arab guy would come in and he would say, man, why are there Kabyles here? And we're even, part of what we're singing is in Kabyle. What, what in the world? And they, they would go from a position of great adversity to seeing that in Christ, there's no distinction with any of that. The beautiful picture is that because of Jesus, we are one. Even politics. Some would say, hail Caesar. Some would not. Some would say, well, I'm actually from another background. I'm from uh, maybe Africa, or I'm from the Far East. I'm not from Rome in, in Corinth. And so the politics would be different. And so they would say, oh, no, let there be no divisions among you. See, there's many different things it could be. For some, it has to do with education. For some, it has to do with family background. For some, it may have to do with profession. And what we see here is that God calls us to be one in him and to recognize that. Letter B, verse 26 shows us that this is the healthy and godly proper response, that we recognize that we are one together. Now, notice that there's two possible threats in this passage. And if you have your Bible open, you'll be able to see this. There's two possible threats. And this kind of is what is revealed in this passage, that some Christians reveal that they do not understand God's vision for the church. You see, some people are like this. They, they feel inferior or insignificant, so they're not going to really join into the church. They're not going to, you say, well, I'm, my name's on the list, but, you know, y'all, I'm not like everybody else. Y'all don't really want me. And what the Scripture is saying is, that is absolutely ridiculous, In fact, that is so ridiculous, that would be like if the foot said, I'm not part of the hand, I'm not part of the body. Or if the eye said, I'm not really part of the body. I'm going to stand on my own. We start to see that it is absolutely ridiculous to think 
along those lines. But, but just the opposite of that is sometimes true. Some people feel superior and self-sufficient to others. They feel independent from others. Look at verse 21 of this passage. In verse 20 it says, "That I cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. You see, some people come into the life of the church thinking, I'm just here for the music and just the teaching. I don't need these people. I one time heard, quote unquote, a seasoned Christian say, you know, I'm 60 something years old. I've got all the relationships I can handle, all the ones I need. I just want to come here and and just be. And I said, we are not the church for you. Because that is an unchristian spirit. That is an unchristian attitude to say you're, you're not wanting to enter into everything that God says he saved us for. That we would love him and love one another. Jesus made that very, very clear. The second great commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, look at the letter number three, letter A and B. Some people feel inferior, like they, they don't really belong, and others feel superior. Now, I'm going to say this. A few decades ago, letter B was the big threat in American churches. That there was some people who really felt superior to everyone, and there was a kind of a one-upmanship among cultural Christianity. You would often see that, you know, somebody wanted to teach this class, or somebody wanted to do this job, or somebody wanted to be in charge of this, or, or you know, everybody kind of in the church would know who's the superior Christian. You know, everybody would kind of know who the super Christian is. If you were to peel open his shirt, you know, it, you know, you'd see Superman there. Or, you know, who, you know, who can pray on the fly, who can do, who can do this, who can do that, you know, who... And, and there was very often, even, even in a lot of churches, carnal churches, there would be rivalry for position, not just among men, but also even sometimes among women. And, you know, who's more holy, who's more powerful, who gives more, who, there, there would be this thing of superiority. And that was very often a very big problem. But I think the greater threat in this day and time is letter A. I think the greater threat in this day and time is so many people backing away from the body of Christ and thinking, man, I just, I either I don't really add up, I can't really engage, I, I, I'm not so sure that, that I'm really accepted. And part of that is because church can often be a cold, hard, unloving place. There are many churches that you go in and no one says anything to you. There's no room in the schedule. There's no room in the heart whatsoever for you. We have dear members in the life of this church that have moved a few hours from here and they've gone to church week after week, same church, and they will often stand in the center of the foyer after the service and no one says anything to them. And these are great Christian people. These are people that would be a great asset to any church. And I mean that in every spiritual way. And, I mean, and even a guy fell down in the life of the church right there in the foyer. And this, one of the people, or one, this couple is involved with med medical things. And she went and ran to him and said, are you okay? You know, and everything. And it was, yeah, 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 I'm fine. And he helped her stand up, or she helped him stand up and everything. And, and she even announced, she said, yeah, well, we're new here. And he goes, oh, that's nice. And turned around and walked away. My friends, that's... That's all part of this picture of either superiority or inferiority. That's, that's part of an unloving spirit. That is, that is not at all what we see the picture of the body of Christ is to be. Look at verse number four here. We see Paul's correction for the wrong thinking in the church. In fact, he corrects both groups. 
And that's why he goes through it. Look at verse 15. You may have to flip the sheet or just look in your Bible. Over there at verse 15, he's correcting both groups. Notice this. In verse 15, he says, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. So the person who says, I just don't belong, I'm really not in there. Look at verse 16. If the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. See, he, he is saying that thinking is false. And if you struggle with that thinking in any direction this morning, I just want you to, want you to know that the Scripture is correcting you. So you can't think that way, can't act like that. The true body of Christ is together. Look at the next one, letter B. Paul explains the correction in verses 17 through 19. Look down at verse 17. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? You see, we need the sense of hearing. Now, who's the little eyeball in Monsters, Inc.? Yeah, Mike Wazowski. Doesn't work! I should have a picture of Mike Wazowski up there. An eyeball with legs and little hands. It's not the way it works. You see in the whole, the whole idea of the animation and the storyline, he can hear. And he can see. And he can move. The, the picture is, is that we, we are all working together in the glory of Christ. You see, you are all part of one body, letter B, you're all part of one body, and you are all important. There's none that are more important than others. Human beings love to assign value in ways that God never intends. Man looks on the outside, but God looks on the inside. We see that so clearly in the Old Testament, over and over again. And we see it in the New Testament, too, when Jesus walks into a crowd and there's somebody there that her reputation precedes her. And Jesus goes and spends time with her. Or there's the guy that's there, like Zacchaeus, who is known to be a thief and known to be the kind of guy, I mean, he's a legal thief. He's a tax collector for the Romans, and hated. And Jesus says, I'm going home to your house today. Jesus goes and sits at his table. Over and over again, Jesus is looking at the heart. Jesus is looking at what he knows he's going to do in the heart. And he assigns his value to every person. Let's apply this very quickly. Application of this passage to Sheridan Hills. Number one, membership in the local church is biblical and important to the Christian life. I believe that this passage points to what we talk about all the time, meaningful membership, meaningful connection, meaningful accountability, meaningful nourishment together, meaningful cooperation. You see, if you're just a hand out there and you're cut off, what can the hand do by itself? It just can't. But because the hand is connected, Boy, it's beautiful, and it, and it works in the way that God has made it to be. And this is membership. This means that more than names on a list, it's the attitude of the mind and heart. Number two, separator, separating ourselves from the local church is an unbiblical idea. You are out of bounds if you separate yourself from the local church. And I want to be gentle and loving, but whether you're in this room or whether you're watching by... Um, Zoom, whether you're watching by the internet, I want you to know that God has made us to not live lives virtually. God has made us to live lives presently. And and we need to to be aware of that and work at that. There are some people that say, oh, you know, some Sundays I go to You know, I go to John MacArthur's church, and then other Sundays I'll go to, you know, Charles Stanley, and other Sundays I'll go to whoever it may be. And, you know, and and we start to see it's, you know, the smorgasbord of what do I feel like hearing today? My friends, do not be deceived. That is not biblical church life. Biblical church life is being a part of the body. Number three. Our commitment to unity must transcend 
It means go, bo- go beyond our likely differences. Now, you see, we, we are going to have differences. We, I mean, that, that is just simply the reality of being in a body. And it doesn't, in a small church, there are differences. And in a large church, there are differences. We're humans. But our commitment to unity has to go beyond that. And that's what the Apostle Paul is teaching. Number four, our lives must be lived as if we interdepend, interdepend upon one another. That's a, that's a, that's a hyper-dependency. That we are, we are truly interwoven with one another. We are truly interacting with one another. We are truly depending upon one another. See, letter A, you must depend upon others. And letter B, you must be dependable to others. You know, very often we just focus on the first one. But letter B is the song that says, Lean on me when you're not strong. And I'll be your friend. I'll help you what? Carry on for it won't be long till I'm gonna need somebody to lean on. You see, the world feels it. The world knows it's, it's real. It's needed. And both of these go both ways. You know, how foolish it is for you to have a need and somebody be willing to meet the need and you go, nope, got it. Don't need that help. Friends, God has called us to depend upon others and to be dependable to others. Number five. Every member must use their gifts and abilities for the function, for the body to function. God has given you certain things that nobody else has. There are certain prayers that you will pray. There are certain letters that you can write. There are certain things that you can teach. There are certain things that you can do that nobody else can do. And God has called us to interact with our gifts and our abilities in the body to function. In fact, that's really the thrust of what chapter 12 is all about. Number six, we must accept and value care from all parts of the body. As a church, we need to accept and value care from all parts of the body. That that means that God has made us to work together in this great dependency. So church family, as we think about Sheridan Hills, as we think about what God has made us to be, we need to see that we are truly one body. And think of that human body. That human body, listen, that's been been made in an amazing way by an amazing God that can do really amazing things. I mean, that, that guy who climbs up the rock, It's pretty amazing that God made a human where they can do that too. And they can go to the deepest part of the sea. And they can build things that are are just amazing. This brings what you see, all that shouts his design. The way he made our brain, the way he made our nervous system, the way he made everything to work together. It's all this glorious significance. Well, what action can we take? Number one... When we look at a passage like this, the first thing that we look at is that coming into the church. How do you become a member of the church? You repent and believe that Christ died for your sins. You see, the doorway is Christ. The doorway is the cross. It's not coming and sitting in this building. It's not writing a check or making a transfer. It's not changing a diaper. The way into the body of Christ is through the door of Jesus Christ. He said, I am the door. My sheep come in and out through me. Have you repent and believed upon Christ? You see, receive him. In John chapter 1, verse 12, it says, But as many as received him, who believed in his name, his name is Yeshua, which means Jehovah saves. You can't save yourself. He saves you. That's what it means. 
that you believe in his name, that you can't save yourself, that God is the one who saves. To them he gave the right to become children of God, those who believe in his name. So maybe, maybe you're here today and you've never come to that place of just turning from your sin and yourself and turning to Christ by the grace of Christ. If you hear his voice calling you today, just say, today, today I want to repent and believe and follow Christ. At the end of this service, there's going to be folks over there and there's going to be folks over there. We would love to talk to you about that and help you to work through that in your life. Number two, be baptized. If you repent and follow Christ, be baptized. And it's through baptism. It says we are all baptized into this body. And that is both spiritually, it's a spiritual thing, but it's also a physical thing. It's the the public presentation of faith to the world that says, I am in Christ. I have identified with his death and his resurrection. Be baptized into covenant membership of the body of Christ. As Brianna today was baptized and she comes forward saying, I want to be in this body of Christ. I want to be recognized as a fellow follower of Jesus. And we say, based upon her confession of faith and based upon her willingness to obey the Lord in baptism and her statement in that, we come to say, welcome, Brianna, to the church family. Look at letter C, number three. Commit yourself to Scripture, prayer, in Lord's Day worship. Well, I'm preaching to the choir this morning, rainy Sunday. I don't know, some of you may be here for the food, but um, I mean, we, here we are. We're gathered together. I hope you're in the Word. I hope that you're in prayer. I hope that these things are part of your Christianity throughout every day of your life, that we commit ourselves to the truth of God, to communication with God, and to the worship of God together. Number four, connect yourself deeply to other Christians. We do that through community groups and through growth groups. And it's a fight. I mean, the world fights against that. Your flesh is going to fight against that. You're going to be tired. You're going to be busy. There's going to be other stuff. There's going to be some who just don't respond. And you know what? God said, well, you don't just give up on your brothers and sisters in Christ. You keep going. And you keep relating, you keep going deeper. And you know what? No church is perfect. You're never going to find a bunch of perfect people. And if they seem to be, you may, again, need to run the other way. Because it may be very ingenuine. Number five. What can you do with all of this? Carry the gospel to all the world, locally and globally. God has called us to come and see and to go and tell. That's what he's called us to be. May we be a people who live out as the body of Christ this integrated, beautiful plan of all of God's design. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's stand together and pray. Father, this morning we thank you that you have designed well the body of Christ, that you have designed us to be one, that you have designed us not to be divided, that you have designed us to be interdependent, that we would invest in one another, that we would not be so selfish and independent and self-sufficient that we have no need of one another. Lord, I pray that you would convict us of that great American sin. Lord, our wealth deceives us. Our homes, our independence, Lord, the walls, all the entertainment, the busyness of our culture deceives us and causes us to be very independent. And Lord, we recognize that this is sinful. We need to turn away from a cold heart toward brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, you've called us to sacrifice like Jesus sacrificed. In our time and our heart, our attention, our money, everything about who we are 
is to be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you. Lord, I pray that Sheridan Hills would represent this passage well. Lord, I pray that we would obey it stronger and stronger in the days ahead. I pray that while the world tears itself apart, Lord, that we would say, we are with the unifier. We are with the one who comes and reconciles and heals. We are the one who empowers to love. And Lord, I pray that there would be many who look at us and glorify the Father in heaven that come to know you because, Lord, we have obeyed what you said. Lord, forgive us for the ways that we don't do that. Change it. Root it out in our hearts. Lord, change it from us. And may we be the true body of Christ that you have designed. In the glorious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Sheridan Hills, I want to say, I praise the Lord that I'm part of a church that seeks to love one another. I praise the Lord that I'm part of a church that really does care and really says it doesn't matter what your accent is, doesn't matter what your skin color is, I love you. Lord, this, this is, church family, this is glorifying to the Lord. May we grow in this, amen? May we stand in this in every way. Let's sing together.